Welcome to the Wellbeing Designers Podcast. My name is Reka Deak. I am your host. This podcast is about well-being at work and in life. We discover how we can design the future of well-being together so we can create human-centric organizations and a sustainable work life. In the first season of the podcast, I talked with the first generation of well-being leaders in big organizations. Usually, they were the very first ones in their organization ever to have the title of head of well-being or similar. In the second season, starting with episode 9, you will meet similar people again, and I invited some other interesting profiles as well. All these people work on well-being on a systemic level. Their mission is related to make the world a better place through focusing on well-being. In the past years, especially since COVID, employee well-being got on the top of the agenda, not only for companies worldwide, but even some countries and other official institutions started to call for action. In the Wellbeing Designers podcast conversations, I would like to highlight the work of those sometimes invisible people, leaders, who are either in charge of well-being in organizations and trying to navigate amongst the growing amount of well-being offerings while connecting efforts to business impact and most importantly, create real value for employees. Or they are those leaders who are doing their best to create international forums to exchange, raise awareness and take action on well-being and people sustainability. They might be the ones whose responsibility is to take care of hundreds, thousands, or ten thousands of people's well being. They might be the ones who keep decision makers and CEOs engaged about the topic of well being. They might be the ones who are proving that employee well being is a strategic enabler of sustainable performance and business success. They might be the connectors between well-being leaders across companies and countries. I call these people well-being designers. Enjoy listening to them and learning from them. Together, we can design a human-centric work life and the future of well-being. Our guest today is Chris Cummings, the group CEO of Wellbeing at Work. Chris is on a global mission to create workplaces where employees thrive. He is the organizer of the global series of Wellbeing at Work Summit, global workplace community called the Wellbeing at Work Hub, and the C-suite community driving change across the world called Wellbeing at Work Bespoke. Chris is also co-founder of the Inside Out Awards and is an advisor to organizations with purpose around the world. You can find more about his work at www.wellbeingatwork.world. Hi, Chris. Hi, Rekha. How are you? <laughs> Very good. Thank you. I'm on this uh, sunny Monday here at the <laughs> Wellbeing Designers Podcast. How is the weather where you are and where are you? I'm currently in the UK and it's surprisingly warm for October. So yeah, very happy. Sun is shining and yeah, we're very pleased. I was lucky enough to participate in uh, the Wellbeing at Work Summit in Zurich earlier this year. And there you shared your story and that was very impressive for me. Well, you were very impressive with your panel, Rekha, and uh, we're, we're highly appreciative uh, of you being involved. So thank you and thank you for the invitation to join you on this podcast it's very exciting I feel honored to be here I, I started uh, well-being at work uh, back in 2014 um, it was through uh, like many in this world through personal circumstances really it was my partner's uh, condition and subsequent poor treatment at work uh, and so it sort of motivated me to bring leaders together uh, and try and change the conversation around well-being at work back then it was very much yoga classes, fruit Fridays and things like that. 
there's more and more data coming out around uh, mental health, about the wider well-being of people and how that affects performance and all of the good stuff that leaders want to improve in the workplace. I started out uh, on this journey to, to create a movement of leaders around the world to try and change that. Thankfully, we're still here nearly 10 years on and still thriving. So it's exciting. Personally, I live in the UK on the south coast of the UK, close to the seaside and like to enjoy the walks along the sea with my dog. So yeah, that's me. How did this influence you that you live in the UK? I think the UK is quite ahead in general with well-being topic, especially with mental well-being. How did this empower you and your business? I think in certain areas, is the UK is further ahead in some areas. As you say, mental well-being is certainly ahead. There are some really interesting things that are going on around the world in, in different locations that I think we can all learn from. Uh, and I think that's that's really what we're trying to do now is, is bring the best from those different areas of the world and, and bring that to, to our communities in, in each of those locations. One thing I have learned doing this over the last uh, nine or 10 years is learning, sharing. Employers are very open to, to sharing the, the success stories and the challenges uh, that they've had. So uh, I think that's been really important. And if we can continue to do that, you know, we're all trying to do the right thing. We're all trying to to make workplaces better, uh, healthier, more productive, uh, higher performing teams. So, so if we can share those success stories globally, then uh, I think we can all do a much better job. So uh, it feels like a very supportive community that we have now. What exactly uh, do you and your team does at Wellbeing at Work Summit? Yeah, so so our, our summits take place in, in 10 regions around the world. So you were involved with our European summit, but we take place in North America, South America, UK, Europe, Middle East, South Africa, uh, Asia, Australia. We have pretty much most continents covered and, and, and have those regional communities. We'll have those annual summits uh, taking place where we bring leaders together. But off the back of that, a lot of our communities are saying that that's great. Once a year is is wonderful, but we also want to have that support throughout the year. So we have our hub, which is our our online platform, which provides those toolkits, calculators, budget calculators, benchmarking data, reports, really to help uh, employers do their well being strategy better. Um, so again, sharing some of that best practice globally. And the third area that we have is, is bespoke. And again, a lot of employers come to the summits and they say, that was wonderful. What next? So we try and bring some of that knowledge from around the world and, and help employers to develop those strategies and work with providers, wonderful providers, and, and really showcase the best uh, providers there are out there to help employers. Because again, we're all trying to do the right thing. So if we can do that together and collaboratively, then... Uh, I think everyone wins. How did everything evolve since 2014? You mentioned it at the beginning, and we all know what a different meaning well-being had back then. It was more like wellness, and it evolved uh, to this uh, point where it is today, which is really about like strategic, holistic uh, well-being that is not only a standalone uh, program or intervention in the company, but it really then goes into the operations, daily work, business processes. So how did you see that through your lenses, this uh, evolution? From very early on, when I started this, it was very much, you know, banging the drum around looking at this holistically. So I, I think in those early days, we had some very siloed activity within organizations. So there might be the odd workshop here and, you know, fruit Fridays or whatever it might be, yoga classes. And actually what we've been trying to say over this period is let's start thinking about this uh, strategically. Let's start thinking about this holistically and let's look at every area of the business. So just because you have a new app, which is well-being focused or meditation focused, that on its own doesn't fix the problem. So looking at every aspect of the business and like you say, business processes, you know, do we consider any other investment within a, a business? You would expect things to improve. If, if you get uh, a new machine in a factory that's faster, 
you would see more product productivity. So that in itself, I think, is a well-being investment because it's improving the lives of those who are who are working in that area of the business. So, so looking at it truly holistically, and what we've started to see over recent years is is more of the C-suite really thinking about this strategically we had the president of capital one uh, canada speak uh, a couple of weeks ago at our canadian summit talking about how that strategic approach has really impacted the business performance for me it, it's very much around linking well-being to high performance and that holistic approach is really having a, a, a massive impact so so yeah thinking about it strategically holistically and continuing to evolve, you know, making sure you're listening to employees on a regular basis, adapting your strategy accordingly, and looking at every aspect, you know, simple things like the onboarding process. What is your onboarding like? What's the experience like? Because what happens in those first six to eight weeks really sets the tone for an employee. So, you know, how can we improve and and, and put a well-being lens on all of these different aspects of the business to really make uh, everyone um, flourish and uh, and be happy and healthy and more productive. I find it fascinating how you were a bit uh, visionary. That's how, how I would say in 2014, as you also have a, an event background, as I understand, right? So you were already in the event space and then you saw this need for well-being and bringing people together. Uh, mm. So very well done. <laughs> Thanks for, mm. for doing this. <laughs> I certainly wouldn't say I was uh, visionary. I, I think it's more about the, the necessity and, and just looking at how we were doing business and, and what we were doing in organizations and, and sometimes you see you spot things in life that you just say that you accept and you might think they're wrong but you just go about your everyday life and and this was this was strong enough for me to to be motivated to do something maybe i'm a secret campaigner at, at heart <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you wouldn't call yourself visionary, but more like someone who then takes action on things that he doesn't like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what are the best examples that you came across, either you know in the corporate world or in the public sector, which support to elevate the topic of well-being in organizations? You have seen a lot during mm. these years. <laughs> It's really difficult to to pinpoint one particular organization or, or one particular situation because uh, every organization is different. They'll have different types of workers uh, and there'll be different setups, different cultures, different regional aspects. You know, if you talk about a global company, you know, having one size fits all with all of those different regional aspects is quite difficult. The, the best examples uh, I've seen in terms of in terms of action is really really listening to employees. You know, so if you are going to do uh, a post survey or if you're going to ask your uh, employees uh, a question around well being and and how they feel, then ask that. Really analyze that data and then act on it. So, you know, your your people are speaking to you. So yeah, the worst thing that you can do is avoid it and ignore it. So really understanding that. I, I think also at looking across the business and the types of skill set that we we need for the workplace of the future. So I was speaking to one organization recently who said they are they're completely transforming their leadership training because the types of skills that they want going forward as an organization are different to, to what they might have been before because uh, when when they took on those leaders. So a, a real emphasis on the, the types of skills and the culture that you want within an organization. And I think, you know, life, is, life has been quite hectic in recent years. We've had a lot to deal with. So I, 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 I just don't think that old style of management, that old style of leadership is is relevant today. More and more uh, leaders are, are, are waking up to that and, uh, and understanding that and responding to that. If we can really change uh, that leadership style and demonstrate the value 
of what that can bring. And we're starting to see that, you know, the results of organisations who focus on well-being are really seeing massive their gains. Um, there was one presentation at our UK summit a couple of weeks ago that linked well-being and the stock market price and significant uplift <laughs> on those organizations who are really focused in. So, you know, as a CFO, you would be really interested in that, you know. So it, it's it's everyone's responsibility and, and the gains can be made across the business. Um, it's not just financial gains. It's not just the right thing to do, which I, I think it is. Um, but but there are some significant gains that um, that organisations can make just by prioritising this. So um, so I think that message is starting to get through. There's still a lot of work to do, and we'll continue to do that um, and, and demonstrate the value. We've gone from this is a during the COVID period we have to look after our people. It's really important. Now it's a business imperative and we're demonstrating that. I, uh, I see that similarly that it really goes into the leadership development programs and some companies have been already doing this uh, anyways to put self-leadership and creating self-awareness uh, uh, into the leadership development programs, but some were more focusing on the technical stuff. Now it's really the time to change that. What I also see, and I would like to, to get your view on it, I really see that the employee well-being movement is um, an opportunity to offer this skill building, creating self-awareness to everyone in the company, not only leaders. Mm. And I find that super exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's what sort of organization do you want? It's fine doing stuff at the, at the top of an organization, but it needs to filter through. So, you know, team managers everyone in the organization thinking about that recruitment process as well what sort of skill set are you looking for going forward it used to be when I you know was looking for a job many years ago you know you had to have uh, a university degree at a particular level yeah you, you had to have uh, achieved x y and z and what are we looking for now in our future leaders what's what types of people do we want to bring into organizations to enable that culture to thrive so so that this is what i mean about making well-being a strategic priority it's not just bringing on an app it's not just doing a bit of training here and there it's it's really looking at every aspect of an organization right the way through from who we're bringing in and the culture within the organization to that future leader piece and if we can get those bits right which some organizations are doing you'll really see the results mm. Yeah, yeah, I love that you say that. Where I also see a big potential is in uh, transformation uh, programs. Every company has a transformation, <laughs> at least one. You know, I have a management consultant background and there it would be a must uh, to have a well-being aspect uh, to take care of the well-being of the people going through the transformation mm. as well as the consultants who are supporting it. So that's something yeah. that might come. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think another area uh, and something I, we did personally in our own organization a couple of years ago is really looking at the strengths of the individuals, making sure that the right person is in the right chair doing the right job and ensuring that they get energy from and, you know, purpose and and performance from each of the areas that they're they're working on and if they're doing things that are not a strength of theirs and they don't want to be doing it and they that's dragging them down then let's move them away from that really looking at that job profile what is it that you're doing in an organization are you doing the things that you really want to be doing because when when someone's in flow they fly and they thrive job descriptions job profiles really understanding and again this can be done at a micro team level putting people in the right chair where they want to be so they really thrive and flow and again we've seen the uplift and and the results from that uh, it's been been really good which one was your most memorable summit so far <laughs> oh, that's an almost impossible question um, i think the first one nearly 10 years ago in the uk was, was very memorable there were you know, it, it was the first one of, we, we didn't know where it was going to go. So it was a fantastic day. It was exciting. It will always remain in my, in my memory. Just looking at how 
each of the regional communities continue to grow and thrive and take on a life of their own. So, for example, we, we did our first one in Dubai seven years ago, and it was really difficult to, to get uh, that region to, to look at well-being and mental health back then. And that was the exciting part for me. And, and I look at that community now and seeing how it's really thriving. It's really embedded into the organisations and it's a really exciting uh, area. And Zurich, you were there for our first one this year and, you know, really excited to see off the back of that now, seeing how that could really develop and we could build a really strong community there as well. So they're all exciting. They're all great in my eyes. They're all memorable, but I guess the short answer would be my, my first one years ago. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> By the way, why did it take so long to bring this summit to Zurich or this <laughs> part of the world? <laughs> um, well, look, I mean, we, we could do it in every city of the world. And I, I've lost count at how many times I receive an email at least once a week uh, to say, please bring it to this uh, city. <laughs> and obviously, um, I've got to look after the well-being of the team as well to make sure we're not overdoing it in terms of how many summits we can do a year. I guess Zurich was on the cards Back in 2018, we started looking at it. I spent some time there and we were planning to do something. And then, then COVID got in the way and, and slowed us down significantly on bringing to new areas. So there was a few regions that we had lined up, uh, but obviously COVID uh, slowed us down. And, and, and since we've come out of that now, um, we're, we're re-looking at some of those uh, locations and and Zurich being one of them, which uh, which was great. It was great to to get it off the ground, and I'm excited to see what happens next then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was curious about your answer because uh, we got in touch, you and me, in 2019, first time. Mm. And uh, that's when I was involved in an organization um, organizing a future of work event. But previously, so <laughs> before that, I was really looking into organizing a organizational well-being event. And I also found it quite tough uh, still in Switzerland. The whole conversation started from a very different level than today when we talk about uh, organizational well-being. So COVID pushed the topic really. Mm and have to put it on the agenda for uh, yeah. many companies and leaders. So, yeah, I was just curious uh, what was there <laughs> in the background. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're, we're very uh, we did. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. We are close to the end of this interview. Um, it's amazing how time flies. How do you uh, see the future of well-being uh, and your role um, your personal role or the role of the Wellbeing at Work Summit? What we need to do is, is continue to provide the, the best possible information, the data, the, the case studies, the examples of, of success stories. We just have to continue to, 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 to drive that message. We're seeing more and more organizations taking it seriously. So how do I see the future? Personalization is a big area. AI and data uh, will play a big part in the future of well-being. And I, I think we still haven't quite figured out how we're going to be working in the future and, and what that looks like. Uh, and I think there's some some big changes in the workplace coming in the next uh, couple of years. And I think AI will, will play a big part in that. And it's not all negative. It's, it's actually quite a positive uh, story. Uh, as organizations, we need to really think about how we, we take that forward. Measurement and impact is really important. You know, we can't be spending millions and billions of dollars on developing well-being strategies that are just not having an impact. The whole idea of this is to deliver results. We need to see that impact, whether that be through high performance, whether that be reducing absenteeism, whether that having healthier workplaces, all of those things need to be uh, uh, clearly defined. I think the future is very bright. I think it's a growing subject. It's an area that more and more organisations are realising uh, is really important. I think it's a bright future, but we've just got to make sure as an industry overall that we take it forward in, in the right way. I uh, always ask this question from my guests, uh, how do you measure uh, well-being in your organization? So yeah. I have two questions for you. If you <laughs> can share, you know, any of the 
best measurements that you have uh, seen during the summits and heard about, as well as how do you measure the success of your summit? <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in terms of the summit, really the results based on what you're trying to achieve. But it's getting easier and easier to, to measure as long as we're clear about our objectives. Um, so, you know, it's like any any other business area. If you're looking at marketing or operations or sales or, or finance, all of these other areas of the business, you have various measurements in place to make sure that those are achieved. So exactly the same for, for well-being. Hmm. And the last question, we go back a bit to the personal side. Uh, mm. I would be very curious to hear what you do to take care of your own well-being. I live by the sea. So regular morning walks along the sea with my dog, out in nature, peace and quiet, you know, no distractions, no phone, just getting back to simplicity is really important to me. And, and the wider nature, you know, getting out and walking as much as possible. I'm a spin crazy maniac. So I do lots of spin classes each week, which again is my sort of switch off. But spending time with friends and family as well, just that connection is really important to me and doing quality time, you know, switching my phone off and having those clear boundaries because when you're working globally, there's always someone awake willing to send you an email. So my phone would always be hopping, but turning that off and uh, and having boundaries is really important. Yeah, and I would add when you have your own business, right? <laughs> <And> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have more your heart in it, maybe. Yeah. yeah. And I love that you said the um, family and friends and the social connection, social well-being community because this is what you are also building through the well-being at work summits and of course uh, it is reflected in your own life as well it's really important and spending time with your family and friends quality time that's the key being present with them and actually having time for them instead of just being in the same room but glued to your phone and um, there's a real difference <laughs> yeah Thank you, Chris, for joining us today. Well, thanks for the invitation. It was, it was fun and I really appreciate it. And we see each other latest in 2024 in Zurich. Yeah, you are look coming, forward right? to it. Absolutely. <laughs> look forward to it. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks Ciao. A lot. Bye. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Wellbeing Designers podcast. If you would like to keep in touch with me, with us, please uh, sign up to the Wellbeing Designers newsletter. You can do this via our website, uh, www.wellbeing.design. You can also reach out to me via LinkedIn or via the website. I am very happy to get in touch with other Wellbeing Designers from all over the world. This is actually what I was busy with these uh, past two weeks. Last week, I was traveling to Hungary, to my home country, to participate in the Active Workplaces Conference. So useful to connect with the people there, to listen to the well-being challenges. And this week, I was at the Horizon Summit by the HR Congress in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam leading a panel discussion with three HR leaders about the importance of listening and belonging, psychological safety in well-being. It went uh, so well. People were so curious to learn more. We had so many questions uh, that we will uh, actually record a podcast episode to answer all those questions. This will happen probably beginning of next year. As for this year, I still have uh, two other episodes for you with two exciting guests, so stay tuned. And we, Wellbeing Designers, are also ready to work with you. So reach out if you or your organization needs ex expertise, inspiration, why and how to create a well-being culture and how to upskill your people, your leaders with future well-being skills. I am doing a lot of keynotes nowadays, inspirational workshops for leaders to really connect the dots for them, why to invest into well-being. 
I also work with well-being uh, leaders together to advise them on the well-being strategy and how to place uh, well-being uh, in the organization, how to scale it. And then we are working on the well-being academy. So if you are interested for next year, how to scale well-being skills in the organization within your employees, please get in touch. Remember, together we can design a human-centric work life and the future of well-being. Oh, <laughs>